Alright, Mo, Adam, welcome back. I think this is episode, what? What are we now? Four? Number episode four? four? Yeah. Um, four? Lots of lessons to be telling people. Um, lots of things going on in our lives. Today we're going to talk about financial literacy, right? And why it doesn't work. That, that seems a bit anomalous. <laughs> because financial literacy is supposed to help you, isn't it? <laughs> and you were saying it doesn't work. What's, what's going on there? Right, so um, there's this thing, Chuang. Uh, it's it's a term coined by some of these, uh, I think, by two Yale professors. It's called the GI Joe fallacy. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you you might be familiar with the cartoon GI Joe. You know that that TV program in the eighties. Yeah, roughly, roughly. Yeah, um, yeah. American um, aggressive, American violence, right. uh, death, right? <laughs> cartoon. Yeah. So yeah. it's. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cartoon and at, at the end of every cartoon episode, uh, they would have like a, because it's a children's program, they would have this like PSA. Uh, and you know, like for example, like uh, th- th- there'll be like a scene of these kids saying, oh, I have a tummy ache. Oh, let's go to the medicine cabinet. And then one of the GI Joes would step in and say, hey, you know, you shouldn't be taking medication if, uh, without any adults here or stuff like that. So it's like more every end of every, every episode, they'll give you this PSA. And then the kids will respond, thanks, G.I. Joe, now I know, you know. And then G.I. Joe, the G.I. Joe would reply, and knowing is half the battle. In actual fact, so the fallacy actually puts out this idea that knowing is not half the battle. Um, same goes with financial literacy, right? We all know the formula to it is spend less, save more. We all know it. No one will tell you. But why is it so hard uh, to actually do it? So, I mean, over the, over the past one year that we've been studying as well, studying the sentiments and how Malaysians actually react to this, everyone knows what to do, you know, spend less, save more. Um, but it's hard because it's an environmental problem. There's nothing wrong with you if you can't keep into a budget or, you know, it's more of your surroundings uh, that comes into play. Everything is built around spending more and saving less. You get pop-ups from your phone, you get ads, targeted ads coming at you to be saving this. And, and this is why it's actually quite, uh, I, would, I would say, I mean, to be very candid, it's very toxic in a sense where people spend more on the idea that they're actually saving less, uh, saving more as well. So that's why a lot of these marketing campaigns that are targeted at you are in fact like, oh, okay, you're actually saving this much, you know. Uh, even when, when you give out a referral code to somebody, I say, oh, you know, if you, if you sign up with my referral code, uh, you get uh, 25 ringgit uh, when you spend. But if you don't sign up, you don't have to spend. So that's even actually saving a lot more. So the idea of why financial literacy doesn't really work uh, is the fact that people know what they're supposed to do, but putting it into practice, that's the hardest part. It's more of a behavioral change. And knowing is not half the battle. Knowing is just a small part of it. But doing it on a daily basis, doing practical things is something that would actually eventually change your financial standing. So when you talk about financial literacy, you know, a lot of everyone will tell you, oh, you got to be putting this budget, that budget, um, saving towards a certain goal. Yeah, we know that. But it's hard. It's really, really hard because fundamentally, it's it's your attitude towards it. It's, It's the practice and also your behavioral change that you have to do. Yeah, it's it's so true. It's so true because you know back in the day when I was like roughly speaking where your you guys are in terms of age, I knew I knew what I had to do. Okay, I knew that with my salary being two thousand seven hundred ringgit, <laughs> I knew that with my rental being five hundred ringgit, and my car installment eight hundred and seventeen ringgit, and my EPF and so so take twenty percent of the top of my salary. I knew what I could have left over to pay for my expenses which is roughly about 10 to 15 ringgit a day i knew that and then i knew i was going to come out on the other side with about this much of margin right i knew what i had to do i didn't do it i got the credit yeah. card i went out at night you know i ordered the jugs of beer i was in the hole by five thousand over ringgit and bloody hell man you do you do that because your mates are doing it you know you, you exactly. do that because on friday night it's the done thing to be going out and then and then it's like life happens, right? Time happens and then 10, 10 to 15 years go by and then you don't have any savings. You haven't put a down payment on an apartment. Um, you haven't bought Microsoft at $15. Now it's, now it's crazy. Now it's $150 <laughs> per share. 
and, and then and then a lot of people they they don't do anything for like literally thirty years, and then they retire or they they're facing retirement and then they think to themselves, holy shit, I've got nothing to sort me out when I start working. It's it's a big thing. It is really a big thing. And what you say more is very true. It's behavioral. It's not theoretical because they know intrinsically in the heart of hearts what they got to do. But it's behavioral. And all around society, it's a spending society. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it was a mindset change, doesn't it? I mean, you like you know, knowing is only half the battle. Like, I want to say it's not actually half the battle. It's only like thirty percent of it. So I think, like you're saying, right? You didn't end up doing these things that that, that you knew that you should have been doing, but at the same time, it also requires a sort of uh, I think confidence is very important and and self worth, right? You actually have to be able to believe that you're actually worthy of being someone successful and someone rich, you know, because if you don't act or play the part again, right? It's about doing things, right? So if you don't act or play the part of a rich person, you're never going to be a rich person. Right? So uh, it, it really does require a mindset change in terms of, you know, how do I start thinking about money in a much more sort of abundant way, not a scarce sort of way, right? You know, there's, there's money, money is everywhere, you know, but you need to yeah. be equipped with the right tools and the right um, skill set in order to actually go out there and find it, you know, knowing that it's there is one thing, right? But then you got to, to actually act upon that, right? So it's not just, it's just a mindset and a behavioral change, right? And it's interesting when you say that, you know, life hits you and then you realize that, oh, shit, I haven't done anything. I also watched this video the other day of like, they were taking snippets of people at different ages, right? Saying, okay, at age five, what are you saving for? At age 20, what are you saving for? At age 40, what are you saving for? And I found it quite interesting because the people at age 20 were saving up for a house or a car. And then you have, then we keep going down the line and at age 40, this, they, they're still saving up for a house and the car, they still haven't gotten there, you know? So yeah, this is where you can see that really it, you know, to each their own and not everybody is um, maybe as woke as they are at 20, knowing they can save, but not only at 40, they're looking, hey, look, now I need to save for a house. Now I need to save for that car I've always wanted, you know, or whatever it is, not that goals might be. You know, that, that abundance mindset, right? Don't, mm. don't you, you know how... Um, intrinsically um, contradictory that that mindset is because if you have an abundance mindset and then you also live very frugally the image that you're projecting to the outside world is one of poverty po not not positive well, poverty right or, or not having a lot but then you know intrinsically that you're putting money aside you should be but then to the world at large you, you don't appear to be and that can be very hard um, especially if you're just starting out in life. And, you know, behaviorally yeah. speaking, Mo, I mean, we, we know, we, we know what we're supposed to do. Whether it's studying exactly. for the exam, whether or not it's putting aside money, um, behaviorally, very few of us are dis disciplined enough to behave in the way that we're supposed to. That, that is why the police are, are there, that is why the courts are there, <laughs> that is why the judges are there. Um, how do you propose we do this, though? Well, first of all, Chuck, it, it, I mean, maybe I can, I, we, we can try to uh, liven the mood and saying that it's not your fault. Uh, it is not our fault. It's not the millennials fault. It's not the, the 20 it's nobody's year fault. Self. Yeah, to, to say that why are you not saving? It is because of your environment, uh, essentially. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, the, your environment is set up in such a way and it doesn't help with social media and stuff like that. You see people at their success, at their peak, you know, spending, getting on the, getting on that yacht vacation and all these. But no one really actually shares about their their financial freedom journey. Uh, it's a very small community. It's a growing community right now uh, where people are starting to realize and say, "Hey, I I look at my neighbors and I say, wow, he's got a new car, right?" But no one says, "Okay, how much do you have in your EPF?" No one actually shares that. Uh, rather than say, "I got a new M4." She said, yeah, I've maxed out my ASB. I've maxed out all my ASB's account. Uh, and, you know, that really is about how we actually portray ourselves, like what you mentioned. Um, I'd rather have a maxed out ASB account <laughs> than, than the M4. Yeah, yeah. But obviously, no one actually shares that. And I think it's, 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 it's about building this community where we, we turn it on its head and say, hey, look, um, success in life really isn't about the fleshy things but it's, it's about the time and freedom that we are able to achieve. Ultimately, that's wealth, right? Uh, wealth is just your time and your freedom and, and the money that you use is just an economic vehicle to actually store this uh, to, for when you actually want to discharge it. So 
I think what we probably need to do is to have this open conversation and start talking about, you know, talk, start going up to your coworkers and say, hey, how much are you earning? Are we doing the same job? Are we paid equally? Um, you know, am, am I being valued the same way as you are? Having these open conversations that might sometimes feel very taboo and very awkward is something that we need to change. And that starts really from behavior. We need to stop thinking about um, the M4, the white picket fence as the yardstick for success, but more on the fact that, you know, I, I can retire at 45 and I can spend more time with my family. And, and I, I'm able to actually put my kids through the best schools and the schools that I actually want to and not be able to settle for that. So it, it really all depends on what, you know, how our environment is actually playing this out to be. And it's a sad thing because uh, our, I mean, obviously our community still values and the very fact that, you know, we still look up to, to people with, with, you know, you know, like we have gold chains and all these kind of mommy jarum kind of stuff. It's like, whoa, he must be super rich. <laughs> Yeah. You know, but in actual fact, you don't know that was that that ring was paid on installment. So it really is about um, the environment and how we actually perceive success. I think that's fundamentally what we're trying to do here, also at Hey Alfred. Yeah, guys, you don't know how factually accurate that statement is, in the sense that it is not the fault of the um, of the ignorant or the young or the financially uneducated. I'll give you an example, right? You know how in EPF, you've got this ICNA scheme now where you can withdraw your money um, and you can withdraw it up to like a minimum of like a hundred ringgit or a thousand ringgit, you know, from your account yeah. too. And I, I find that to be intrinsically, um, I would say irresponsible. Irresponsible is a very, very strong word. Um, but to allow people to withdraw their money to, admittedly it's their own money and they need the money to pay for expenses. But basically, I think the powers that be want people to withdraw the money from EPF is to be able to let them go out into the economy and consume. And by them consuming, then to rejuvenate the economy to get it back to where it was pre-COVID, right? Yeah. And that's wrong. That's wrong. That is wrong because that money is the only source of savings. And then if you allow them to take it out, what are they going to fall back on when they hit 55 or 60, right? Yes, it's their money, but to let them do that so that you allow millions and millions of people to be responsible for rejuvenating the economy. When let, Let's face it, right? by and large, if the country was responsible before COVID happened, like say Singapore, for example, which has like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of, of sing dollars in, in reserves, then you wouldn't have to resort to such desperate measures, right? Because you've got the savings and you haven't had things like corruption or whatever to, to, to waste it all away. Um, then you wouldn't have to put the responsibility onto the people for them to bring the economy back. And you can see that happening in America as well. The America's debt is ballooned. I think their debt is now something like 27 trillion. It's going to go to 29 trillion because of Joe Biden's latest $1.9 trillion stimulus measure. That's all on the taxpayer. It's not on, on the government. You know, so there's very, very few fiscally responsible countries in the world today. Um, I'd say Singapore is one of them, maybe. I'd say that some of the Scandinavian countries are quite responsible. But by and large, they're putting the responsibility on the people. And I think that is inherently irresponsible. you know. And compared to them, which are all these batteries of economists versus the uneducated, uneducated masses, cannot fight. Cannot fight. No fight. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I guess. I, yeah, I guess. Well, different nations adopt uh, different economic policies in that sense, and this Keynesian way of thinking, you know, like just putting more monetary policy. The market, yeah. yeah, yeah, the monetary policy is somewhat flawed, right? I mean, like we take for example our own country, with uh, you know, who are, we know that the country is already in debt. Uh, we're reaching at like an eighty-nine percent of the debt ceiling or something like that. Uh, but we're still, you know, they're still printing more currencies and flooding in with the market just so that, you know, the velocity of transaction actually goes round and round and people spend more and that adds on to, uh, you know, it, 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 it contributes to the GDP increase and all these other stuff. Because at the end of the day, um, how we actually track this is all numbers. It, it, might, it might look numbers from a monetary pol policy standpoint, you know, with an increased GDP, you know, increased velocity of movement, payments, transaction going on this. That's something that they have to look after because that simulates the economy. But when you actually go down to the granular and you actually see how it's affecting people's lives, that's, that's the big social problem. 
um, that I think a lot of these uh, you know, economic policies don't actually address. Uh, they are economists for some reason, and they're not socialists, right? Uh, and, and, and they look at the ones and zeros. Uh, you know, you have to be, you have to be someone like a, maybe a psychologist, maybe try to put a psychologist up there and see how it is actually affecting someone's life. And, and you know, uh, whether, this, whether this 100 ringgit um, that you, you're giving as a stimulus package would actually affect them. You give them 100 ringgit, and so what? You know, it's going to be gone the next day. They're going to blow it up and buy something or even, in fact, use it for their daily need. But it ends there. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I think there is a certain degree of irresponsibility if you're like essentially just giving people this free money, essentially, like most said, just to be able to transact so they can trace that, okay, the economy is doing well or whatnot, right? There should be some kind of education. Okay, look, we're going to give you a hundred ringgit, go out and maybe spend on this, something that you need or essential. In fact, I mean, again, this is taxpayers' money, right? They don't even need to just give out free cash. What they can, in fact, do is is come up with a with a package that is more beneficial, right? Maybe whether that be in like you know in the form of like actual food or actual supplies and actual appliances or whatnot. Um, knowing full well that you have a population with a financial literacy rate that is quite low, and people who don't just don't know how to manage their money, they don't know, you know, um, making ends meet every month. So, you know, I agree that, it, that there is a, a certain degree of responsibility or um, ethical standard that needs to be applied when we actually, you know, start engaging in, you know, these stimulus packages or essentially free money. Yeah, yeah I mean, some of the numbers are quite disturbing. Okay, I could be wrong or some of these six could be a little bit outdated. But I think generally speaking, the EPF discloses that 80% of Malaysians who have reached retirement age have less than below the um, statutory minimum. I think the statutory minimum is now something like 250 or 260,000 ringgit, and most Malaysians don't have that at age 55. Okay. Then the other thing is insurance, right? The insurance penetration policy, the insurance penetration rate in Malaysia is something like 40, 45 percent at best. So less than half of Malaysians have got healthcare coverage, right? And even then, of that 45%, it doesn't mean that it's it's the same across the board because that number is skewed by certain individuals who have more than one policy because they've got the financial ability to do so, okay? And then you've got things like um, the literacy rate. Don't even talk about financial literacy. Just talk about literacy alone. The, mm-hmm. the number of people who can read and write in this country is, is some way short of the global average among OECD countries, right? So we want to be we we wanted to be developed by the year twenty twenty, and that I I don't think we're gonna get there. Uh, in terms of GNI per capita, um, I think we are somewhere about the same as Brazil and Argentina and South Af- South Africa, at best. Okay, we are like a fraction or one fifth of what Singapore is and what Iceland is and what, um, you know, some of the most wealthy countries in the world are. So. So f- financial literacy is basically level three when we haven't even attained to some degree level one. Do you, do you know what I mean, right? Um, but yeah. if that behavioral change were to be implemented from the, from the start, say, say from the family, say from the parents or say from your peer group, then that's a big thing. It is, it is a huge thing, actually. Um, you know. Yeah, but then, um, it, it, then again, Chong, like you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, like uh, is it the responsibilities of the parents to be teaching their kids? About I think so. I think so. I yeah? think so. Because if it isn't, yeah. then who can't rely on the schools? You know, can't rely on the on the government for sure. Governments want you to spend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they want to report good numbers, right? And there's nothing more fallacious than in the entire production of one country, basically summarized in one percentage number right six percent gdp yeah. what the hell is six percent gdp exactly do you, you know yeah. what i mean it's, it's meaningless yeah that's why i i really like and i think i think the only country in the world that actually adopts this system is they go by uh they measure happiness uh, is bhutan yeah. bhutan has a new index that measures yeah. uh, growth yeah. happiness right yeah. yeah and i think that's something amazing that we could probably learn from um, but also, this, I mean, from behavioral change, and that's something that we ourselves at HLF are trying to impart, right? Uh, we're not trying to tell you you've got to save 20%, but we're, telling, we're giving you practical tips on how to actually do that. Now, take, for example, there's this hack, there's this calendar hack that we, uh, that we figure out as well. I think this was done by some of the guys in the States and all these other stuff. There's, if you take, if you pay off your, if you're trying to pay off your credit card, um, over a course of a year, and you put a hundred ringgit every month towards towards that uh, payment of your credit card. By the end of the year, you would have paid uh, twelve hundred ringgit 
uh, and your credit card debt, right? That's great. But if you were to put $25 a day and, uh, and by the end of every week, uh, sorry, yeah, you put $25 a week, uh, by the end of every, uh, by the end of 52 weeks, you would have actually have paid off 1,300 uh, ringgit. So these are the kind of things and these are the kind of tips that you could actually start taking off. You know that you have to pay your credit card. That you know that uh, you know by putting 100 ringgit a month uh, would pay off 1,200 ringgit in debt. But you can't do that. You can't put 100 ringgit at the end of every month. Instead, what you should do is to put 25 ringgit every week. And 25 ringgit translates to 50 at times 20, 52 weeks, that would translate to 1300. You probably be, you know, you probably pay off 100 ringgit more. So these small nuances in, in terms of behavioral change, you can't pay 100 ringgit every month, sure. You can pay 25 ringgit a week. That's, that's not even a night out sometimes, you know, that's your lunch. Just sacrifice a lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah also, because, uh, yeah, because of the way compound yeah, yeah, interest works, really, right? Sorry. Go on, go on. Yeah, yeah, just because of the way compound interest rate, uh, com compound interest w w way it works and how the banking system calculates interest on a daily rest, right? And then, of course, the sooner you pay it off and the more regularly, the more intervals, then you don't get whacked for, for the lump sum at the end of the month, which is exactly how the hack works, right? Uh, no, actually, the hack works on uh, 12 months versus 52 weeks. So there's 12 months in a year. Yeah, that's so, 52 weeks in a, in a year. So you paid off over 52 installments rather than 12 installments. Yeah, and exactly. the, the more times yeah. you pay, then the lower the interest each time. And of course, it, yeah. it translates into a big it's thing called, called down the line, yes, right? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are the little things that you never notice if you never look at the fine print, right? So you're like, you need to be well-versed in these things. And But also, I was going to say on a behavioral level, um, it's also, I think it's important that we remove some of these like misconceptions about money, right? When well, you're talking about a parent's um, you know, like it's a parent's responsibility to teach their children better behavior when it comes to money, right? So I think so all of us would have probably grown up on that saying where you say, hey, money doesn't grow on trees. Yeah, we know that. Or money is the root of all evil, right? You've, we've all heard these, 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 these sayings before. And what that actually does, it actually kind of stops a person from actively going out there and um, being able to uh, sort of formulate their own um, way of, 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 you know what I mean, like getting more money or whatnot, right? Actually, it's actually becomes a barrier to success because you're afraid of success and you're afraid of the next best thing. And so that's why I think a lot of people also don't end up saving. It's just because, um, or, or, or even planning out their lives, just because they think, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm never going to get there anyway. I'm never going to be as rich as the next person, right? We always compare ourselves to the next best person, um, you know. You, we in the M B40, we compare ourselves to an M40 and think I would love to be at that level, right? And the same so on and so forth, right? It's never going to be enough. Um, but it's just those practices around money and those those little nuances that we need to to fix, right? These misconceptions about what it sh what it should be. What just it just be. yeah, just to echo what Adam is saying, you know, like uh, I think one of the one of the money mentors that I used to follow is uh, Kiyosaki, and Kiyosaki always describes uh, this idea of. Um, the, the poor will say, I can't afford that. But the rich mentality would say, how can I afford that? So it starts from there. It starts from your own, oh, well, in the Malay society, they have this thing called niat, right? Where's your niat? Yeah, and niat is half the battle, you, you know. So <laughs> if you really know, yeah, if, if you, you, get half, yeah, you, get, yeah, you get half of it really, you get half <laughs> the reward. So it really is um, what your intentions are. If, if, if you think, oh, I can't afford it, then sure, you're never going to be able to afford it. But if you start thinking about how can I afford that, then, then you automatically start thinking, okay, you know, I might be able to do this and do this and stuff like that. So, yeah, going back to that as well, you know, when, when, when you actually spend and stuff like that, I think Chuang, remember when we were talking about this, like why are the millennial generation like spending on experiences and rather than not acquiring stuff as well. It's also, you know, when we were doing our research, we found out that in actual fact, when you buy something, um, that, only that only translates into an increase in happiness or so-called happiness, increase in dopamines in your chemical brains and all this stuff. And when you acquire something, you feel like, oh yeah, you know, I have this now. But buying, on ex uh, buying, through, uh, buying an experience also gives you the same kind of dopamine. So let's say, for example, one of the tricks that we, uh, we like to do is that, you know, if you're looking to buy a shirt, instead of buying it for yourself, buy it for your best friend you'll get the same sort of happiness. You know? <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. 
Um, uh, funny enough, you should mention uh, Kiyosaki because Mo, just at lunchtime, just earlier, I was talking to my son about um, about one of his principles, right? Which is basically how rich people and the difference between rich people and poor people, right? Poor people uh, work for money and rich people have money work for them. And basically, this is because I just came out of the bank and had a really, really bad experience with, with just opening a savings account. It was worse than childbirth. <laughs> and the poor girl that was basically, you know, attending to me, you know, low level lah, you know, low level clerk, and 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 basically they're pushing paper, you know, um, yeah. so so they don't know why they're doing it is they they don't they don't know why they're doing this work. It's the people above them and the superiors who will not be phased by the COVID crisis and the recession. Those people will never lose their jobs. It's the low level workers. Who don't have this education? Who don't have this literacy? Who don't have the awareness? Um, it's tough. It's tough, and then it it just worsens because then with their children, then they don't pass on this knowledge, and then it's just be, it becomes kind of like a a self fulfilling prophecy of 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 ignorance, which is very very bad because you want to have a, a, a society which just gets better every cycle, every generation gets wiser and cleverer about money. And then at the end of the day, on the other side, you've got the whole country full of intelligent people who know how to make their money work for them. You know, I, I don't know how you guys at Hey Alfred are going to get this Doppler effect of um, awareness going. It's it's a big thing. It is a business for sure because you know education is a good business, and people like Kiyosaki has gotten rich from imparting financial wisdom. Tony Robbins has gotten rich from imparting wisdom generally. Um, I don't know, lah, mate. I I don't know. Behavior is hard to change, you know. Behavior is hard to change, Chong. It definitely is. Uh, what we would like to do is, and we understand this, is like I mentioned at the start, it's your environment, right? So we can't change someone's behavior, but we can change the environment we're in. You can't, you know, you you can't suddenly say you you're gonna have, uh, you know, uh, your living your living conditions is the only thing that you could probably change about yourself. Um, so it's about building that environment where where people can actually come in and say, "Hey, look, I've got a community now that talks openly about uh, money. It talks about f- achieving this freedom uh, that we all strive for, and I feel a part of it." So essentially, that's what we plan to do, uh, and we are still at a very early stage where we're trying to go against uh, a system that has been in place for a very long time. But we can't change the system. But what we can do is that we can change our own environment where we're in. If you don't Amen, want to be brother. part of it, yeah, right? 100%. Only you have the ultimate choice. Yeah, hundred percent. How how big is the community now? How how many people have you got? Um, in terms of the people on your platform. Yeah, we're close to ten thousand users strong. Uh, That's good. I think this That's is a good number. Yeah, something that we are still working towards too. Obviously, we have uh, a lot of other uh, campaigns and a lot of other. Um, you know, our so-called our, our our launch would be sometime next month. Uh, we're going to be also having this thing called the savings or simpan challenge, uh, where we're going to force. Uh, so recently, AKPK said that Malaysians can't save a thousand ringgit, and we're challenging that statement. Instead of saying, "Oh yeah, shit," you know, Malaysians can't save a thousand ringgit, we're saying, "No, we can," and we're going to prove it to you. So in the month of April, we're going to have this game where, but we're going to actually force upon you to save a thousand ringgit and if you do you win some cash so win 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 right um that's so pretty good that's something that's something so, that we're looking forward to yeah just to add on to that as well i mean like yeah it, the, the change really starts with us right we don't like i mentioned the first time we had a talk we don't want to be, give this perception of us and them like we just we just invested in this <laughs> sorry for the pun uh, in this <laughs> as you are you know what i mean this is this is a journey for ourselves and so people need to see that mo and me and sam are all you know trying to better ourselves in terms of our financial learning so come join us you know come join us and be a community and let's do this together you know i'm no better than you you're not better than me let's have these open conversations and let's do something about it right okay so we're running out of time um got a couple minutes left what are the three things you can impart to in three tips you can impart to people uh, for, for, for them to meet the goal of, of, of saving a thousand ringgit in the next 30 days. Suggestions? I'll start off. I can say, for me, I would say, uh, you know, there's a difference between financial um, literacy and also financial 
what I like to call financial confidence, right? You need to be able to go out there and be confident in doing what you need, doing what you need to do in order to fulfill your 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 dreams or whatever it might be, right? The other thing is also um, just to have some kind of compassion. Um, understand that you know people around you are maybe not great, are not as great as you, but also have compassion for those who are greater than you, and understand that your situation is not the same as theirs, right? Everybody has their own personal struggles with money. Um, so those are my, those are my, there's only two, uh, but those are my two. Uh, well, more maybe. Yeah. Well, I think we will have a lot more tips because over the course of 30 days, every day we will give you a single tip, uh, actionable, practical tip that you could actually do. Uh, it ranges from, you know, the fact that, hey, just call up your credit card company now, uh, get them to lower down your interest rate, just do it. Interesting. You know? or, or to the fact that, um, okay, um, one day of the week, don't have, bring food from home. That's it. Interesting. And yeah, and probably, you know, one of the other tips that we could probably think about is uh, redesigning your online environment, you know, use an ad blocker for, for, for God's sake uh, and stop getting, getting duped, you know. <laughs> so these are practical tips that we're talking about, not, not saving 20%, saving 10%, but things you can actually do now. Fantastic, yeah. guys. Fantastic. Hey, yeah. really, really, really good tips, man. Really good information. And one of those statements that make you think, you know, financial literacy is not what you think it is. It is behavioral. You know what it is to do, right? You just got to change your behavior. Hey, guys, thanks a lot. Um, fantastic Pleasure, information Tom. as always. Good luck. Speak to you next week. Talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks a lot, guys.